Hi guys, this is Dr. Aeronautics, and today we sit outside a parked Delta Glider 4 uh, to begin our first Delta Glider 4 tutorial. Uh, this tutorial is on the panel uh, locations, and there is a lot of buttons. But, unlike the XR2, uh, the Delta Glider 4 buttons are all grouped by subsystem, so it's much easier to find. And that actually brings us to the second uh, part, which is subsystem operation. Unlike the XR2, the Delta Glider 4 uh, simulates every system, from power to propulsion to life support. Uh, everyone requires careful monitoring, although it is autonomous, so you don't have to every day check on the pressure or the uh, partial oxygen pressure. That's taken care of. Uh, but without any further ado, we're going to go ahead inside. So uh, the ship is completely off, and the first thing you're going to notice is there's no air or docks or ventilation noise. And you should know why that is by now, because I said every system is simulated. Right now, it's simulating that the air ducts are off, therefore there's not going to be any noise. And they're off because we have the, uh, we have the doors open here, so they don't need to be on for any sort of reason. So uh, if I start in the mid-panel, you will recognize some of the things here. Uh, let's see if um, the main bus is necessary for a... Oh, no, it's not. So here we have our emergency lights. We have left engine, right engine, hover engine, fuel, hull temperature. Um, I believe that's flight control surfaces. Power, uh, gear, extended or something like that. Um, carbon dioxide warning, oxygen warning, pressure warning, temperature warning, uh, I believe that's system warning and life support system warning. So those are, that's our warning system, comparable to the one in the XR2 Raven Star. And here we have our, uh, autopilot status indication lights. And these are actually indication lights, they are not buttons. Uh, if you want to turn on, well, in the simulation, you can at least press these and it will, uh, it will take. But if you want full realism, you have to do what I do, and that is you actually have to program the computer to run the autopilot program. So, you can already recognize some things here. This would be the... Uh, MFD along with this one so obviously again two MFDs that's pretty standard uh, here we have HUD modes but you'll notice that if I try and turn it on nothing happens that's because the HUD powers off and I'll get to that in a minute so over here we have the system message indicator that is always on and it always draws power unless the system fails um, when I say fails, I mean the battery, the auxiliary power unit, no external line, like everything fails. Uh, you'd probably be dead before the system message indicator would cut out. And then we have our ship control, and you'll notice that there's many more control services than is supported on the um, XR2. So you have pitch, air flight control, then you have uh, Elevon and Gear, which is the full atmospheric control. And then you have Translation, which you should know what it is. Rotation, I'd be surprised if you don't know what that is now. And Atmospheric Auto, which will turn your systems from uh, air flight control surfaces to reaction control system automatically uh, when the partial pressure, or rather the dynamic pressure, gets too low for the system to operate. Uh, which is handy when you're doing something like re-entry or ascent because it ensures there's no loss of control. Over here we have a flight computer backup display. This will later be on and indicate things. And then we have our fuel uh, display here. We have our main fuel quantity and percentage 
mass and flow, same thing with the RCS. And then we have a status bar with the amount of fuel that we have in. And uh, right now it's not reading anything because the system is off. So here we have uh, thrust vectoring gimbal controls. So this would be yaw. So this would change the direction of the engines this way. And we also have pitch, which will change the vectoring this way. I don't really use the gimbals much, but there is an actual automatic mode. So if we go to comp auto and we pitch up, it will actually vector the thrust with the direction we want to go to save on efficiency. It's not very useful, but that's basically what these three, three do. Is They're just various modes of operation in the main engine gimbal. So here is our main thruster right here. This controls the engines. And uh, I'm actually thrusting up right now. And uh, you can't tell that because the throttle's not moving. And that's because it's locked. Again, the system's off. So the hover throttle looks a little bit different. That's That would be this bar right here. Uh, the hover engine can't operate either because... Actually, I don't think there are... Yes, there are. Because one, the doors are closed. Yes, this actually has hover doors. Um, by the way, this is not a scramjet. It's just an air duct. Oh yeah, and the doors will open for the air duct to draw air in for the fuel and oxygen. But uh, you will not be able to use any scramjets because the X, sorry, the Delta Glider 4 does not support any scramjets. There is no scramjet model. And then there is a remote thrust counter here. You can actually make your thrusting autonomous. If you set a countdown, you can actually make it thrust after a certain period of time, which I'm going to do when we uh, do the space missions for Norst and Lantaniso. So then we have an engine display with the thrust level for the left, the right, and the hover. This is thrusting in percentage. And then again, level and percentage, same readout as here. Thrust in kilonewtons and acceleration in meters per second squared. Thus, you have your, ma your thrust here and your mass here. So you can always do the calculation of what your acceleration will be here. And if you want to hold a constant acceleration, not necessarily the maximum, you can thrust, you can off-modulate your thrust so that you can actually... Uh, you can actually hold an acceleration profile and meet the laws of physics perfectly. And uh, lastly here is customize HUDs. But you should know that by now because I've explained that. Uh, one thing before we go to the upper panel, uh, you will see we have our payload door open. This is the payload bay. And we can store up to four uh, UGCO cargo and just so that you can uh, take a look at the various cargos available, uh, we can bring up the uh, Delta Glider 4 payload center. There it is. And you can look at the various uh, things here. So we have fuel that we can't use, uh, various modules and controls for bases. We'll use those in the Norston Lantaniso series when we land on solid bodies. They have flags you can take, a landing beacon which will actually send out a uh, radio pulse. Again, I'm going to do that when we do Norston Lantaniso things. So we land a beacon, deploy it, and then that allows a mothership to home in on it and land. Then you have oxygen that can be used, can be used by the craft, just like the XR2. It is an auxiliary fuel source, so if you run out of oxygen, you can import any from the bay and use it, and then jettison the empty thing. There's even automatic probes that you can send out as well. Uh, I don't know what sample rock and space food are. I think those are new. Space fuel you can actually use and import. So if you run out of fuel and you're carrying one of these, uh, you can keep with it. Uh, we're going to be bringing plenty of extra fuel to our um, bases at Norst and Lantini, so because it's going to be fully realistic, we need to bring all of the fuel we need with us until we run out, I'm sorry, until we have the ability to produce our own. 
thus being able to manufacture it from the surface. Uh, but we're not concerned about that right now. And then uh, Space Rescue UMU, I think that's like a life module or something. I've never used it before. But we'll explore all the opportunities uh, as we work in our still non-existent vehicle assembly building and other things uh, at the Space Center in Norstenland. Why am I making so many Norstenland connections? Uh, it's probably because I'm halfway through line four, which means we actually uh, are going to invent flight soon. Once we're done with the railroads, we can move on to flight and uh, very large naval vessels, which I'm happy about. Um, okay, upper panel. And my, 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 look at all this stuff. Uh, it's not that complex, though. Uh, let's start from the center. Here we have our readout that was on the XR2 and the uh, regular Delta Glider, the stock version. And here they work as well. So you have angular velocity, uh, which is how quickly you are rotating. Then you have angular acceleration, which is how hard you're thrusting to start rotating or being perturbed. And then you have a torque indicator, which shows you how much of that acceleration is being applied in thrust. And then you can figure out what your moment of inertia is uh, without any fun integral calculations that we have to do in school. Then down here we have a mission timer backup display. This reads in minutes and seconds, uh, and then this reads in just seconds. But it's off right now, just like everything else. So uh, maybe it's actually a good idea if I turn this stuff on later so you can see it. Uh, we move on here to gear. Uh, the gear is off because the main bus is off, so I can't move anything but here we have uh, the gear up down button and then we have hydraulic pressure so you can actually turn off hydraulic pressure and if you accidentally press G you can't raise or lower the gear so the only time you have the hydraulic pressure is on is during the takeoff roll and on final approach so after you take off and put your gear up you then lock the hydraulic gear and that way it won't open at Mach 7 and then blow your craft up. Uh, let's move on to the airlock then. So here we have uh, the status indicated in pressure, which I believe is in uh, deca kilopascal. So I believe there's 10 of these bars, and each bar represents about uh, 10 point three kilopascal mm -mm. uh, 10.13 kilopascal uh, and then we have an outer door status and inner door status readout those are blank the system is off and then we have the control to open the nose cone which you can see here just like the XR2 the nose cone is open although it looks like the older Delta glider and then you have controls for the outer door and the inner door and then here is the working system uh, to pressurize and uh, evacuate the chamber airlock and then this is the docking uh, undock button so then we have uh, this panel here and this is a strobe which is basically a light uh, the checklist kind of irritate me because they call for having the strobe on all the time which wasn't isn't really necessary when you're in deep space so I turn it off because it conserves power, as indicated by our ammeter here. And we have a bell, which is nothing more than a bell. Uh, it is like a uh, status message from a typical airliner that you would hear when they'd say, like, fashion your seatbelts. I don't know if it's going to work now because the systems are off, but let's see if the, the EPU will run it. <laughs> nope. That's basically telling me that there's a power failure. So not even the bell will work when the system power is off. And then the seatbelt button, which basically puts on everyone's uh, seatbelts and puts the astronauts in their suits. If we go inside, you'll see they're not in their flight suits. Well, they are in their flight suits, but they don't have their space suits. They don't have, for example, this on, this big heavy bulky pressurized suit 
that you can use outside. Um, well, because duh, they don't have any helmets on, so you would basically depressurize and yeah. Um, that covers the whole right panel. Uh, so then we have, again, a system status message. Same thing as this. Oh, yeah, and this is a reset button. You basically push it, and it will reset the alarm. So if you don't want to hear the c computer screaming that there's an emergency at you, you can reset the alarm. But, again, I really don't do that because I like the computer screaming at me because it, it tells me that there's something wrong that I have to mitigate. So uh, let's do the power system first. Uh, we're going to now go into the subsystem operations. So this is the uh, APU EPU start panel, and this is the auxiliary power unit uh, operation here, and bus controls the power bus, which basically shunts the power around everywhere in the spacecraft. And these are the various systems that you can give it power. I'll give it an order of priority with the first the highest priority first and the lowest priority last. This is also the order that I turn the power on for conservation, but not at all the order that the checklist takes. I actually don't like the checklist because it's kind of uh, minimal effort. It will tell you to turn the HUD on and then the MFD and then the radio, which is not at all what you want. Uh, if you go in order, the highest priority would be the life pack, followed by the computer, then the main bus, then the engine, then the airlock, then the radio, MFD, and HUD, in that order. So that is the order I turn it on. So these are the various systems here. This button here is an emergency power uh, button here. You actually have to hit it to open it up, and then if you touch that, it will actually activate a fuel cell which is there for emergency power purposes, but I'm going to go ahead and close it because we don't want to use it. Um, emergency power is only for emergencies. If you start using it, and that's if the, the battery and everything else fails. If you start using it and it fails, you're basically done for. So, and then we have a battery which can be used to start the uh, APU. So if I cut the external power unit, and then replace it with the battery, you'll notice that we have starting bus voltage. And then we're going to go ahead and turn the... You can actually hear the electronics uh, power up when we plug in the external power unit. And this basically indicates that it's charging our battery. And the battery is used to start the auxiliary power unit, and the auxiliary power unit is basically your power plant. Uh, it, it generates your power using a fuel cell, and allows you to run all of your systems up. So we're actually going to start it right now. So we do that by also turning on the battery so that we have full power uh, going in. And then we hit APU start and you will hear the run up sequence and you will read off the messages out here as things happen. So starting in three, two, one, now. Okay, so the APU has been started, and now you can hear that familiar sound uh, that you can hear from outside. This is why I love this craft so much, is because it's so realistic. Started all parameter nominal. So the next thing we have to do is address the APU here. Um, I'm sorry, not the APU, the generators. Uh, the auxiliary power unit does nothing when you don't connect the electric generators, because all it's doing now is... Uh, splitting, let me see what it's doing. It's combining hydrogen and oxygen into water vapor uh, and creating electricity, but the circuit isn't closed, so we're losing the electricity. So now what we do is we turn on the generator, and you'll see the APU will power up the generator. We have two for redundancy, and we run both at all times for redundancy. There we go, now they've powered up, so we can select either generator bus one or two, but not emergency power for emergencies only. 
So 96 volts is the normal, but I think we can operate all the way down to like about 80 volts. So the bus has to be at least 80 volts in order to operate. Uh, now that we have an APU started, we can cut the battery and we can cut the EPU. The APU will continue charging the battery. And you see now we have no external start bus because nothing is connected. So if we kill the APU, we can't start it up again without connecting one of these two. So this is our bus selector. You can choose which one you want. Uh, and then this is the mission timer reset here. Bus status indicator light, so it'll go red when there's no power. So before we do anything else, uh, let's go ahead down here. And this is the massive lower panel. Uh, it is a very complex panel, but it's very organized. And I can go through it all. So let's start with the uh, system status. So this is basically the same status message. And then down here is a checklist. So you can see, remember what I told you about all those checklists that you can do. There's 15 of them. Not all of them are checklists. Uh, 1 through 10 would be checklists. 11 is special. 12 is auxiliary reference. 13 is reference. 14 is reference. Oh yeah, there's also an ejection seats in this craft. So if there's an emergency. Uh, and limitations. So if we go down to 15, you'll see each one has its own one. And then this will tell you uh, all of the maximums. By the way, landing speed 200 meters per second. Uh, it is a... This craft is a uh, all-around fail. If you land at 201 meters per second, the craft will break up and explode every time. Unless you disable that with chicken mode, which I'll explain later. And then this gives all of the maximums here. Uh, but you can, oh yeah, and here's the temperatures. And they are a lot colder than the XR2. Uh, the XR2 can survive temperatures much higher than this. So you have to be careful. And notice, if there are any doors open, immediately the temperature drops. And if the cockpit door is open, well, you have to go really cool. And uh, be careful about that. Uh, especially uh, if you go to Venus, which we'll do for one of the Norston Lantaniso episode series. Um, right, okay. So that was a checklist. So then we have the main flight computer, but we can't go into that until we turn that on. So I'm actually going to start the life support system first, uh, because it's the first thing. Now, if you watch this total power used... Uh, the life pack isn't taking any more power right now. Why? Because the whole thing is off, aside from the displays here. So we're going to go ahead through everything. This is the refueling system for the life support system. So here we have uh, a docking switch and a uh, external switch. So we have the air right now, and we're stopped, so we can activate that external valve. And if we hit A, there now we've just refueled. Our oxygen is 100%. Turn it back to off. Disconnect the line. And now what we can do is turn the system on. So if we turn that to auto, whenever the oxygen is low, the tank will make the air flow. Same with the nitrogen. We want the nitrogen to flow because if the oxygen flows, then we will have a 100% oxygen environment. And if you know what happens when you have a 100% oxygen environment, well, if you don't know what happens, uh, learn about Apollo 1. You owe it to the world to learn about Apollo 1. Uh, okay, so then we have cabin air recycling. And this is the system, this is the, uh, like the HVAC system that controls what is going on. So if we turn the fan on, now the air is recycling. If we filter it, Contaminants are now being filtered out, which, by the way, this doesn't mean anything because we have the doors open, so the atmosphere is going inside. We turn on the temperature control here, and we turn on the moisture uh, removal here so we can remove excess humidity. 
And you'll notice we also have a backup system, which will, I will also activate right now as well. So everything has a backup system. Now let's go ahead to the uh, data displays. So this is data, and it's basically a readout of everything going on, again, in PSIA, which I hate, because I don't know what the minimums and maximums are for humans in PSIA, but I do in kilopascal. Uh, if you're curious, you can just look at the Delta Glider, um, the massive manual book that they have for it, and there is a detailed chart. Actually, you know what? There is a chart on board. I don't even need to bring this up because the chart is actually programmed into the computer. So then we have the set data. So here's what happens now. Uh, you can set the pressure, oxygen, and temperature for it to autonomously maintain. So if we change the temperature, we're set at 21.2, and you can set it to anything you want. I don't know what the limits are because I don't like to set it, uh, although I think we will in the Norris Atlantic ESO. You can also set the uh, pressure, or rather the oxygen percentile. Go too low, and your um, crew will suffer hypoxia. Go too high, and you suffer hyperoxia. Let's see how, how high the pressure can go. Okay, 14.7 is the max, but you can dial it down. So you can actually de depressurize yourself, resulting in crew death. And this is the graph that I was talking about. Uh, and this is the, uh, well, you can see it's written out here, hyperoxia and hypoxia. So this is the percentage of oxygen versus the pressure in air. So you can set yourself to anything in this green zone, that blue line is the best fit, and the um, maximums here, uh, right here, you have uh, the hyperoxia, which means you die of oxygen exposure, and hypoxia, which means you run out of oxygen, and this curve, which represents what you can do. So we can actually theoretically depressurize the craft to about one-third, given we jump the oxygen up to 100%, which again is incredibly dangerous. And here we have a reservoir uh, readout. Notice we put the tank on automatic, which means it will not draw unless there's a demand. There's no demand because the windows and doors are open, which means there will not be consumption because the air is circulating. And you'll see here, current readout saying that there's about six days in each tank, or well, seven days in each tank, which means there is about two weeks of oxygen in both container. And then we go to the crew, and if you press this button again, you can see the uh, heartbeat, and and this is, this is, you know, very detailed. You can see the name, age, what they are, their heart rate, and um, heartbeat. And you can actually analyze this graph and, and figure out what emotion, not emotion, but what state they're going through, like if they're going through shock, there's a characteristic uh, one for that. If they have hypoxia, you can tell. If they have hyperoxia, if it's too much G-forces, when you're going through high G-forces, the heart rate and breath rate will go up. So here we have the other people, and you can see each graph is slightly different, because everybody is slightly different. And uh, so that's that. So then this is completely, this here is completely unrelated with the life support system. This is the external radiator, which I can't open because the bus is closed, but it looks the exact same as the uh, stock Delta Glider radiator, except, um, no, it, does, it doesn't actually simulate anything. Yeah, so that's one of the few things that isn't simulated. Here we have a Windows Ray filter, so, well, that's not going to work because there's no power. But if you basically turn that off, uh, it, energizes the, um, it energizes the windows to bounce any cosmic radiation. So when you fly in the atmosphere, I generally set it to off. When I'm in low Earth orbit, I set it to medium. When I'm in deep space near the inner planets, I set it to high and outer planets realm to medium again. But you can set it however you like. 
Uh, here we have a crew EVA, so we can actually um, select someone. This is the exact same thing for the XRT Raven Star. You perform an EVA, they basically sit out here, and you can walk up to the crowd, press E, and then they get back in. Um, okay, and then here's the ejection seat uh, system, so you can arm it or safe it. It's safe now because we're, we're practically off on the ground. And then we have, uh, this is the configuration file um, thing, which I will explain later. But you basically hit this button and it will load whatever settings you have in the, um, in the configuration file. So if I go ahead and hit this, watch this screen here, you will see that uh, things have just changed. Now instead of two weeks, we have one week of oxygen because that's how I set actually. We have six days of oxygen because that's how I set it, um, which will change based on the amount of crew aboard. So if we had four people get off, we have five people on board. We had four get off, then we'd have um, four times the amount of oxygen available to us. So this is the model, Delta Glider 4-3. The engine power, which is the Mark IV, which happens to have 260 kilonewtons of dry power. There is a Mark V with more power. And uh, we'll go through the different engines as we develop the technology with Norriston Lantanisa. We have the um, maximum oxygen reserve, which is the total of our tanks, how long that will last us. And then we have our fuel reserve, which is short range LAO, which means the uh, specific impulse is very low. What was I going to do? Right, turn on the computer. Oh, by the way, notice the power is now up to 40 amps. That's because we turned everything on. And if you look, the, the computer is booting here. This is one primary, well, the backup display, actually. But this is what you look at most of the time and the main flight computer display, which is here, here, and here. So we have to wait for that to boot, and now that's done booting. So here's what we can do now. If we go to display, we can look at the menu, and there are backup, dis I mean, there are um, other options for this. So if you go to one, you can see that there's no program loaded. So let's say we wanted to um, do a taxi hold autopilot. So here's, here's how you would program it. You would say program 200, and I know this one, spec 0, and enter. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's the, um, that's the kill rotation. Hang on a second. I believe it's pro 400 spec 0. Let's see... There we go. Um, that's the taxi. That's the taxi speed hold. So you can see we'd hold 10 meters per second. But here's what I was telling you about um, moving around. If you really wanted to do it in real life, instead of pressing those buttons to turn prograde, you would do pro. Whoops. Program 200. Spec one. Enter. Prograde. Then you would hit execute, and it would change the ship. Uh, and then if we send another command, for example, um, Pro 200 Spec 2 it's Retrograde. So eventually, uh, if you learn how to do it with the, um, if you learn how to do it with the um, keyboard, you can do it very quickly. So you can see, you know, within about a second, I would then be able to execute it. Um, but we're going to go ahead and unload that because I don't want to do that. Uh, and then you can also see we have, let's cycle through these faster, we have a deorbiting display, which I'm going to run out of time if I go through all of this, but basically this helps you with re-entry, like what your, your speed at interface, as I would call it, basically when the time matters. So this is your speed at interface, which is the most important thing. The re-entry angle, which you know, Anywhere between 1.2 and 4 degrees is acceptable for the um, craft. Any steeper and you'll burn up, any shallower and you'll bounce. Okay, so this is the temperature display that, that is very similar to the XR2 Raven Star. 
external temperature here uh, and then we have uh, nose cockpit hull left wing right wing oh yeah and then we also have a slope indicator pressure and then we have a total vertical and total g-force on the craft and then speed readouts and and this actually reads out your maximum g-force that you pulled during the flight so you can know like for example you would tell your crew be prepared to survive xyz g's you know because that's what it that's what it registered on last time which is kind of handy uh four basically gives electrical status five gives the um life support status six can do a check so we can actually do um d6 and then we can do something like damage systems so it says there's no damage systems or d6 if we want to know if we're ready for the ship to take off we can hit one and you can see there is a probably more than will fit on this screen so we have a long way to go before we're ready to take off um, d7 is a shortcut so there are various shortcuts programmed in and others that you can actually set as well oh yeah so let's see what you have uh, actually I can go to the um, it should be somewhere in here where it details the autopilots available to you maybe not okay so uh, let's see you can see taxi hold approach hold flight hold docking there's an automatic docking there's an atmospheric flight one there is a one for earth ascent automatic there's even one for re-entry uh, and it's not like the XR2 where it will hold an angle it will actually pitch your ship to balance the g-forces and temperatures it will know that when your craft is getting too hot to pitch down and it will know that when you're starting to to bounce out of the atmosphere it will pitch up so if you know the distance versus altitude graph for the autopilot you can pin down to the mile exactly where the autopilot will drop you out so you will never ever have to worry about uh, re-entering again and not arriving up the runway and then we have eight yes this calculator unlike the stock actually works so let's do the sign of 90 degrees and we get one um, so if we do the sign of 45 degrees we should get root 2 over 2 which is about 0 0.707 and there it is so you can see this actually works here so if we do um, tangent of um, oh wait no I'm thinking arc tangent Oh, we do our tangent of this we should get 90 degrees and we do um, and then we have memory here uh, I haven't actually tried to see if you could do um, secant um, I don't understand how one divided by sine is that, but whatever. Uh, so this this actually works. You can see it, and it's great. So you can, you know, if you ever want to do some math, there's no squaring function, but that's okay. I mean, hey, this thing actually works. Okay, and then the last thing is an external antenna, which has nothing to do with when you're on the ground. That's for communication in deep space. Uh, let's go move on to the next thing the main bus system this basically controls everything that is mechanical except the airlock so you can see we can now turn hydraulic pressure on and off the bell should now work there it is so the bell is working uh, and then uh, oh yes and now you can see all of the displays have now turned on so the uh, system is responsible for that you can also deploy the antenna and open the doors so the door 
Sorry about that. The doors have opened. And that is the uh, main bus. So next we can turn on the engine. And now you can see our fuel amount here and here. We're not actually 100% full of fuel. So what we do in this case is refuel. And what I'm going to do now is turn the volume down because there is a big nasty fuel truck which pulls up when you open the hatch. And you can actually hear it connect. Uh, and it is loud. So I'm going to turn the volume down for you all and open the hatch. So that big nasty truck will pull up. Alright, so you should have just heard that bump. That means the hatch is connected. So uh, we open ours and select for main fuel. Okay, and just like that we filled up, so we go back to that. We go ahead and disconnect and close the hatch. Nasty truck will drive away. Okay, so it's driving away now. Um, and you can see the reaction control system. I don't know what I was telling you about, but basically the thing has filled up again. You can turn the volume back up again. You can still hear the truck because it's noisy. Um, and then we have all of our valves here. So you can actually run a fuel dump here. So that was just dumping fuel. And it will tell you that you're doing a fuel dump, I believe. And this works for both main and RCS. And you can do cross feed, as you can see here, so you can move fuel around, which is handy. But instead of having scramjets, you have a turbo pump, which basically is like an afterburner, which runs the spacecraft that way. So what you do is in between ascent, you will um, activate the turbo pump and it will uh, make the engines more powerful. That's why it says 260 kilonewton A330 is because it's 260 without the turbo pump and 330 when you activate the turbo pump. So the normal thing we do is we turn our main valves on. Uh, wow, that was kind of messed up. On or open. I think I was trying to combine those two. Uh, hover valve for takeoff, but I usually turn it off during flight. RCS would always stay on. Um, except when I'm at high time speeds, because if you turn it off, there's no way you can accidentally do this. Oh right, the stuff's off, so you wouldn't hear it anyway. Um, and then the automatic air intake, which will automatically oxidize the fuel through these vents here they'll open once you go fast enough. And now, we can do what I've been wanting to tell you for a long time. Remember my annoying uh, timer that would sometimes go off? And how I told you that it sounded a lot such like the... Um, a lot like the Delta Glider 4 warning for not having retro doors open, well, here's my alarm. And in two, one. Okay, so that was my alarm. Now watch this. I'm going to attempt to retro thrust, and you will hear the um, warning from the uh, the uh, Delta Glider four. It's almost the exact same, which is kind of funny. Um, so yeah, that that's that gets me a couple times. Um, okay, so. We can move on to the next thing now. Um, so I did the thrust. Oh yeah, here is the remote thrust panel, which is red out here. So you can actually set a um, countdown and advance it in hours, and it will actually read out hours in here. So you can 
actually do hourly math using this. So hours, minutes, and seconds. You can set the exact second um, countdown. Same with the burn duration. So you can burn for two hours and run out of fuel. You can even set your uh, percentage. And it even works for hover thrust too. And retro thrust. So yes. Um, so there are plenty of options. And then the, of course the start stop command. So you can count down and it will let you know here that it's activated. So these are the retro and hover doors. So if you go to automatic, they'll open on demand. Like that. I just retro thrust it very quickly. So that's handy. Uh, and then you have two UMMU turbo packs. So if we open both of these doors, you will see in here, if we EVA, we can fly over to these things, strap them on, and then we can fly around like a spacecraft, which is pretty darn cool. So it's kind of like the human jetpack. So I'm going to go ahead and close those now. And uh, again, the XR2 also has its own version of those, um, which can be seen. Uh, in the Turbo Pack's main um, control for, uh, I think there's like a Kira Pack and a Lee Pack or something like that. Anyway, uh, we have time and temperature readouts for thrusting here. Not that important. And then uh, we have flight data backup display, autopilot, and then we have that long range communications antenna, which I'm not talking about now, that's for communications. It has range. Uh, and then I don't know why there is a seat adjust here, but just yeah, whatever. Just okay. Like I said, everything is simulated. Uh, let's arm the ejection seats now. So that was telling me that the ejection seats are armed. So we can also close the cargo bay doors here. Um, we have systems here. So if we had oxygen cargo in the vessel, we could request it. And it would say that there's, um, well, first of all, the tanks are almost full. But um, there's no, even if we were empty, there would be no way to uh, import the fuel because there is none. So it only works if there is some to start with. So let's go ahead and close that. I uh, showed you the turbo packs. There's also one more thing. A cockpit canopy, which is the equivalent of the... Uh, this would be the equivalent of the um, cabin hatch. There is no such cabin hatch on the uh, Delta Glider 4. So a lot of times what I do is I close the, um, I actually close the uh, airlock. You can actually hear the atmosphere because I've opened the cockpit door. Uh, the last thing I do after closing the airlock doors is close the canopy because that way the idea is you want to try, and now it's gone silent, you want to try and use as much as the atmosphere as you can before sealing your craft away to not being able to use it. There is no virtual cockpit, which is fine, but I'm going to show you one more thing, and that is the ejection seats. So we're going to go ahead and end now, but basically the ejection seat is activated by um, pressing escape three times, and you will see the craft explode because it's not to be used after ejection seats. It's a one-time thing, and then the, th then the craft has to be reassembled, and people get pissed off at me if I did this in real life. But um, you will see people fly and use parachutes, which is always fun. So activated by pressing escape three times. One, two, three. Um, I thought it was escape three times. Oh, <laughs> it will actually uh, stop you.
from ejecting if you don't put your space suit on. So we might eject after putting on the space suit. No. Okay. I hate doing it again because it destroys the craft, but oh, what the heck. Okay, so it's press escape three times. One, two, three. So there it is. Guys, parachute opens. Uh, the doors have jettisoned. You can see there the cockpit door has come down there. And uh, there's the man there safely landing on the runway. So that was a successful test of the ejection seats. Um, I don't know what the heck that thing is. Oh, that's his parachute. As for the other guys in here, I don't know where they went. Um, I'm pretty sure they jettison as well. Oh, here they are. Um, they got out and they're now standing beside the craft. So I guess what they do is they just dive off the wings or something. But the pilot, the pilot has the best seat in the world because it will actually fire him upwards. So that was the ejection seat. And uh, this has been the first XR2. This has been the first not XR2 tutorial. The first Delta Glider 4 tutorial. I think this is like number 26 or something in the Orbiter series. And next time we'll do something else. I haven't figured it out yet, but we'll get off the ground. We'll do something. Like I said, I'm not going to be showcasing. We're going to go to Mars now, and then we're going to go to that. We're probably going to go through... You know, it's probably going to be a checklist run, where each time I basically show you how to run everything else. And you'll see I can't touch anything now, because there's no pilot aboard, so no button works. Um, like I said, one-time thing. And uh, you can see now that the craft is um, quite messed up. So, uh, yeah. We'll run through the checklist, and that will basically show us, uh, or show everyone, how this flight is, or how this vessel is operated, because it's not so much where you're going, and more what you have to do to get there. So I will see you guys next time. Bye.